Welcome everyone to the opening lecture in our fall 2021 lecture series here at the College of Environment and Design. My name is Ron Sawhill. I'm the uh, program coordinator for the Bachelor of Landscape Architecture program. And I have the honor this afternoon of introducing our lecturer. Dr. Jessica Fernandez is our newest assistant professor. And she holds three academic degrees a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Design and a Master of Landscape Architecture from Auburn University and from Clemson University, a PhD in Planning, Design, and the Built Environment. Dr. Fernandez's teaching incorporates contemporary approaches to site design exploration, such as data visualization, virtual reality and augmented reality applications, and the investigation of emerging technologies. This semester, you can find her teaching uh, undergraduate and graduate landscape architecture students in um, portfolio development. And in the spring, uh, students are looking forward to her classes in advanced digital graphics. Her research focuses on the use of new and develop, uh, sorry, developing methods for site assessment, understanding place, and emergent design communication strategies in landscape architecture with one of her specific interests focused on big data uh, as a tool for understanding placemaking and community improvement. Her published research includes titles such as Investigating Sense of Place of the Las Vegas Strip Using Online Reviews and Machine Learning Approaches, Understanding Perceived Site Qualities and Experiences of Urban Public Spaces, a case study of social media reviews in Bryant Park, New York City, which will be much of what she's uh, kind of bringing up to you this, this, uh, this afternoon. Before the neoliberal campus, university place, and the business of higher education, and measuring collaboration in community and campus planning. And then coming up in November, she will be in Nashville, presenting at the uh, ASLA conference in a deep dive session on the topic of big data in landscape architecture. So we encourage you to plan on attending ASLA and attending her session. In addition to her teaching and research, Dr. Fernandez maintains an active practice as a landscape architect, a campus planner, and a lead accredited professional in neighborhood development. Her practice, Alpha Design Studio, is where she applies the techniques and principles she's learning and exploring in the academy to the design and building industry. At this time, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jessica Fernandez as she presents the place to be evaluating people and the environment through social media data. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Professor Sawhill, for that um, kind introduction. So I am super happy to see you all today, and I'm glad uh, to be kicking off one of our first um, in-person lectures in a while. Um, as Professor Sawhill mentioned, um, I am one of our newest faculty members here. And prior to coming here, um, I was a full-time practicing landscape architect. And during that time, um, my focus was on higher education um, planning and campus spaces primarily. And so when I would create spaces with a team, um, I was always fascinated um, with going back and kind of looking at how people would interact with that space um, and to see if they were actually using it, if it was popular, um, if it kind of achieved the things that we dreamed um, for it to achieve for our clients. And so some of the research that I'm presenting to you um, kind of stems off of that interest because there are ways to look at these things and to measure these things um, and I'm fascinated um, with that. So my research is really on the environmental um, psychology side of things. I'm interested in the people-place relationship and as mentioned I also like um, not only looking at people in places but at trying to explore them through um, new and emerging methods. So that does include VR, that includes AR, and that includes um, big data. 
Um, it keeps it interesting for me, um, and I like where I see things are going in other fields and um, want landscape architecture to um, be right up there in the mix, which we are. So um, with that, I will get started. Um, being early in my career, um, I would say everything that I'm doing in my research is exploratory. I'm figuring things out, um, I'm making mistakes, I'm fi trying to fix them, um, and so I look forward to your feedback on everything um, that I present because um, everything is constantly changing, my methods are changing, um, it is an exploratory process. But um, I will start by introducing the study and trying to um, put it in the context of uh, why it's important. Uh, I will move into the methodology of this study. So how did I study a place? What did I do to look at it? Um, how do I create empirical evidence for something? Um, I will move into a discussion of that and share my results. And then I'm going to share some student work on how I'm trying to take that research and um, essentially explore it in, in the classroom and see how students react. And I found that um, obviously students have a lot of ideas, especially about emerging methods. And so what they think about things is really um, interesting to me too, because they experience things like social media data in a very uh, different way than I do. I'm, I'm stuck in um, one world of, let's say, Facebook, and everybody else has moved on to like newer things. So I kind of need to know these things. So I'm going to start with a simple question. What is place? Um, it depends on who you ask, right? There's a lot of different definitions of place out there. Um, in the world of landscape architecture, when we talk about place, a lot of times, or most often, um, we're talking about the human lens of a space and the human perceptions of a space. And so a space does not become a place until it goes through that human understanding. Um, it's our emotions, our attachments, our um, perceptions of how we experience something. So um, in this way, what's interesting is that we don't really know if those spaces that we're designing, um, we don't know how they're going to be experienced. We don't know what kind of places they become because place only exists through the human lens. So how do you go about designing a place if you don't know what it's going to become, if you don't know, if, you know how people are going to perceive it. Well, lucky for us, there's decades of research on um, different facets of landscape character and physical things that we can do to the environment. For example, um, we really like edges. Humans like edges. They make us feel safe and we like to, to hang around um, edges, but we also want those edges to be transparent. We want places to sit. We want the sun and the shade, okay? So there's a lot of things that we can consider um, and there's a lot of research um, that shows these things. Um, what there's a lack of though is understanding what is important in different contexts, okay? So how much of something do you want in a park versus a trail versus other things? Um, so that is a gap that is out there, um, particularly related to the 21st century where we're experiencing places um, in different ways. So this is not really a new exploration. Um, the social aspects of place have been assessed in many ways. Um, William Weitz and his team's um, studies in the late 70s, published in 1980, I believe, kind of revolutionized the way that we look at the social aspects of public places. And so most of you are probably familiar with his work, but if you're not, he basically looked at plazas in New York um, and deciphered a simple question. What, what makes a good space? What makes a great space versus a not so great space? When do people want to use a space versus not use a space? Um, and so since then, we have um, explored this concept in many different ways, but I would argue that our methods have not changed that much over the decades. So today, several research and practice groups are leading the effort um, towards making desirable places. You're going to see a lot of frameworks out there. What makes a great place? Um, guidance to making a great place. And this is really helpful because we want to create places as landscape architects that people enjoy using and that they want to be in. Um, what I see um, that I want to add to the conversation um, is 
you know, which, which one do you choose? Do you have to do all of these things? What's important in particular contexts, such as a medium-sized park? Um, and so I would say that my research is heading in that direction in trying to qualitatively and quantitatively um, look at this type of information and discern the importance and weight of different things. So the Landscape Architecture Foundation is also providing fantastic guidance on how we can um, work with landscape metrics and methods to assess place. Um, again, though, our methods are based on observation, surveys, interviews, going out on a site and looking for maybe two, two days or more um, at what people are doing on a site. And so what I'm proposing is kind of a, uh, not a replacement of that, but a supplement to that. So while we can observe sites, talk to people about what they think about them, interview them, um, look up records, that sort of thing, um, that's kind of, to me, it's ignoring something that's going on. People are perceiving places in different ways. And a walk around our campus, uh, you notice half the people are looking around and enjoying the space, and then half of them are looking at a device. Um, it's a part of our world now. It's not something that I frown on or, or smile on. It's, it's a reality. And so um, I think that we have to take that into context. When we're trying to understand place, we want to acknowledge that we're experiencing places and also that people are on sites all the time rating places, talking about places, documenting places, taking pictures of what they like and don't like. So that's information that I believe is valuable um, in the context of landscape architecture. In today's world, we're socially connected. We're not just in physical spaces. We're also in digital spaces. We have place digitally, good places, bad places digitally too. Um, and these worlds are kind of starting to come together. Um, and so I want to, I guess, capitalize on that because people's social worlds aren't just limited to the places we go to. Um, in this change, um, it also means that um, we're competing with digital places for people's attention. But um, some research ties, you know, different digital places to issues with mental health, for example. Um, and so we want people getting the benefits of those spaces that really help us, right, and that help um, foster um, the good things in our lives. So we have to acknowledge this crossing um, and figure out how to get people into these outdoor spaces. So as of 2020, the average daily social media user of internet users worldwide amounted to over um, 2.25 hours a day on social media, okay? And we have nearly 4 billion social media users. So if everybody that has a social media account is on average spending two hours a day doing that, you can imagine the types of information that are building up. Um, it's a lot of it. Um, people are talking, and what percentage of that is about place? Actually, a good bit of it. Um, people are rating places, like I mentioned, talking about places, taking pictures of themselves in places. So we get so much information build up from this um, that we can start to talk about it in the context of big data. Okay? Um, because there is so much of it out there with all of these site users and all of these people um, talking about these places. Now big data um, is, it, what does that mean? Um, it means that it has high velocity, high volume, and high variety. Okay? So there's a variety of types of it out there that we'll discuss. Um, but then there's a whole lot of it. So that means also that you can't necessarily assess it in the same way that we might assess, let's say we get a survey with a thousand people that respond to it. You can't review that in the same way that you can review social media data because um, it's too big. Right? We have to have ways to filter it down into bite-sized pieces in order to research it and understand it. So how might social media data help us to better understand place? Well, there's, as mentioned, um, there's a variety of data types out there. So I'm gonna focus on a couple of them. Actually, today I'll focus on textual data, but I wanna review the fact that there's a lot of pictorial data out there. Um, Instagram would be a prime example for this. People are taking pictures of themselves in places and um, talking about places on there. So what is that gonna tell us? Well, it's gonna tell us what people do 
in a place. Um, it's going to give us clues as to specifically where they are in that place uh, doing those things and then what do they notice about a place right and um, they're going to take pictures of specific things that they notice and then they're going to say whether they like them or not not like them usually okay um, with textual data you might find this from facebook or yelp or twitter or um, in this case TripAdvisor is what i'll be talking about today and that tells us a little more about people's perceptions of place they're going to tell you I love this space, it was this, or I did not feel safe here, don't ever go here, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so we're going to know what they're thinking, they're going to tell us what they like and don't like, and sometimes you get different things, different answers from these two because it's different groups that are on these, these different types of social media. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So as I mentioned, everything's starting to overlap. Our physical networks, and our digital networks are overlapping. But in uh, our digital networks, we can know what somebody from across the world thinks about Bryant Park that I'll be talking about today. And I think that that's um, powerful as well. So if we have all of this data floating out there, how do you figure out what to look at? Um, what do you focus it on? Well, landscape architects are obviously going to be interested in a lot of typologies, a lot more than what I'm showing up here. Um, but for this specific study, I chose to look at urban parks. Um, I think that it is relevant right now with a lot of the things um, going on. Urban parks are playing a critical role in our societies. So they have been inextricably linked to the health and well-being of the public. And um, decades of research link um, urban parks to exposing people to nature and the um, you know, health benefits of that. Um, it is also linked to health benefits related to socialization. People like to people watch in an environment where that's allowed. People want to see and be seen um, in environments. And so all of these things bring benefits to the public, especially in a pandemic, right? Parks can provide places for us to meet our friends um, and not feel the social awkwardness of not knowing what to do or, you know, we're kind of in a gray area. Um, they are providing places for people to feel like they're still a part of the world, especially during, you know, indoor lockdowns or things like that. People go to parks that were left open, right? Um, and they're finding more and more that that is a safer environment for people to be meeting during this time. So they're really serving a critical um, role. However, that, not all parks are the same. They're not all providing the same benefits. Okay? People are not using all parks in the same way. So we can't say, oh, that neighborhood's got a park. They're, they are good to go. Some parks people aren't going to. Some, people, some, some parks are not being used in the same way. Um, so in this way, um, this is one of the reasons that I think it's critical to understand why one park might be successful while the one down the street may not be as much so. Why do people perceive that space? Why do they want to be in that space more than the other? And we know the basics, but in the 21st century context, how can we figure out um, more of what's going on here? What I'm really talking about um, is understanding the experiences of place um, in new and different ways um, that are just now being explored um, through the eyes and the perceptions of the people that are using them. And so, of course, everything goes through, if I was observing a site, everything would go through my lens. Um, this also, this type of research also, of course, goes through the lens of the researcher, but you have a lot of information there um, to go on and to provide evidence for what you're looking at. So, um, to study this, um, we looked at one case study site, Bryant Park, um, but we studied it in two different ways. So I'm going to go over two phases of research where we really started by simmering down the information and understanding the basics, and then we moved into kind of the intricacies of social media data. So I mentioned one case study, Bryant Park is what was used for these, um, these explorations. So Bryant Park is located in Midtown Manhattan, New York City. Um, it's 9.6 acres, so 
medium-sized park, um, and it's located right next to the New York Public Library. So I show its location because I want to point out that I guess the very urban context of this park and also the fact that it's just a couple of blocks from Times Square. So you would think just based on its location in sheer numbers of people going through this space, um, it's going to be popular. Of course it's going to be popular. It's always going to be popular. There's people going through here all the time. But history shows us that's not the case. Um, Bryant Park is not a new park. It has been around for a long time and its history is peppered with a lot of lows, to be honest. Some highs, a lot of lows too. Um, in the 80s, it was known as a hotbed for crime with a nickname Needle Park, I think. And so I hate to even say that, but just to put it into context, um, just because you have people in a place doesn't mean that it's going to be successful, okay? So today, um, it was actually renovated in the 90s, um, remodeled, um, and today it is one of the most active public green spaces in the world. It has over 12 million visitors annually. It's got awards for everything from design to its programming. I mean, it's known for its year-round activities, and if you remember, that's, that's one of the definitions of a healthy place is being used year-round and benefiting the public year-round. Um, it's active. It's providing people those benefits of nature and socialization. So how do we go about this? Well, and I say we because this is a, a team of researchers working on this. Um, we took over 11,000 reviews from TripAdvisor over the span of nine years. The reviews were um, over the span of that time um, and decided to analyze those and to figure out a way to analyze those. So the use of social media data um, is becoming more and more common for different types of studies, but it has not been widely used um, to look at the experiences of place or to understand and better understand place. So um, you can see on the right here the types of data that we collected. So everything was under Bryant Park that we collected. Um, we have um, its rank in the city, how people ranked it compared to other attractions. We have specific reviews. This one happens to be 4.5, which is very good to excellent. Um, we have the users and where they're from. So we know whether they are local or whether they're um, you know, visitors. We have what they say. And then we have it time stamped. We know when they gave that review, the, the day, the month, the year. So as I mentioned, the study put, took part in two phases. We started um, with a mixed methods approach and we applied a machine learning process called LDA modeling. Um, and then we did topic interpretation on that, published from that. Um, then we moved into a qualitative phase. So qualitative just means um, we were looking uh, more from the human perspective. Um, we wanted to understand the human side of things more. So we really actually dug in with the researchers on that data. Um, additionally, we looked at the sentiment and I will show you how this all works. So as mentioned, one of the biggest challenges of using a large social media data set is figuring out how to filter it down and how to make it um, into a format that you can actually use and understand. So LDA topic modeling, as mentioned, is a machine learning calculation. Um, it assesses the level of statistical similarity of topic terms within a body of text. So it's going to go through the reviews, um, pick out terms, and then start to weigh reviews based upon um, what topic it thinks they belong to. So that, that's kind of a mouthful. Um, basically, it will group the reviews into different topics. Um, the challenge is that it doesn't tell you what they mean. So it'll give you like five groupings of text and it will give you associated terms and it will also tell you which reviews are highest on the list, which are most relevant to that topic. Um, but it doesn't tell you what it means. It just kind of groups them. So that obviously takes that human lens to go in and say, all right, great. I'm glad that that did that. Um, I'm glad it ran it through that, but we've got to figure out what it's talking about here. So for example, um, if one topic, I'm going to give a, an oversimplified example, but if it said summer, shade, cool breeze, ice cream, okay, we're talking about summertime, you know? Um, then we're going to start re reading the reviews to see what they're really talking about. 
So we ran all the reviews through this machine learning process, um, but then we had to go in and, like I said, do topic interpretations. So we had those terms um, to base that upon and all of those reviews that were weighted and we looked through the top 100 terms and top 100 reviews for each topic to figure out what it was talking about. Okay, I'm going to throw another diagram at you here. Um, after we did that LDA process and we got five overarching topics that said, okay, if we look at these, we know overarchingly through machine learning what people are talking about on the site. Um, we decided that was not enough. We wanted to further explore um, and get to the heart of those reviews. And so we actually went through um, and qualitatively looked at those reviews, um, went through several rounds of coding. So concept coding, a sentiment analysis using NVivo software, which is a qualitative coding software, and then axial coding to come up with overarching themes for those. Okay. So here's an example of how a group of researchers might have looked at this. Um, if we have a review, find a shady table, watch a movie, play cards, and more. It is a gym in the middle of a very busy area. We're not talking about one thing in that, okay? We're talking about a couple of things. So we might have taken this phrase, it is a gym in the middle of a very busy area, um, and said, okay, they're talking about respite. They're talking about getting away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Um, so we're getting away from things. So we're going to code that as respite. But then there might have been a few other topics coded that um, all add up to the essence of the site. Okay, people feel like it's an escape. They feel like it's nice. They feel like all of these sorts of things. So that would be the bigger topic. The axial code um, is essence. And you can see that each review was probably broken out into a couple of different parts. So what came out of all of this kind of play on words? Okay, what did we learn? Well the basics, reviewers posted in November and December, um, and so people that are familiar with Bryant Park know that they have this winter market. Um, and of course now I want to go and look at everything because I've been reading about it for a while. But um, they have this fantastic winter market. They have an ice skating rink. Um, they have a lot of things that draw people there um, in New York in the winter. You know, it's cold up there. So you think, oh, and that's when people are enjoying this space, they're posting about it the most. Um, 2015 to 2017 is when the majority of these reviews came from. That could coincide with TripAdvisor popularity, right? Um, other um, things come online like Google reviews. Um, maybe a another platform got more popular, but we have the most reviews from those years, so I have to note that in our research. Um, and then people post it on Wednesdays, okay? So that can tell us, well, people are using this all week. There's not this huge spike on the, wins uh, on the weekends. So those five topics that were detected from 11,419 TripAdvisor reviews through that LDA process included amenities, holiday favorite, summer hotspot, place to relax, and general experience. Okay? So these reflect, again, an encompassing picture of what's going on, what people are um, perceiving and talking about in sheer user perspectives. Okay? So you can see the topics on the left with those associated terms. And then on the right, this is what we did for each topic. We gave it a description, we pulled out reviews that were related to it, um, and then we published on it, um, shared that information before we moved into those next steps. So each of these topics um, that we came up with, we looked at in the context of days of the week, and then months, okay? So what did we find out? Well, despite many amenities being offered year round, people seemed to enjoy those and talk about those most in the spring and fall. Um, should we focus our efforts and people having to do things on those seasons? Maybe. Um, so you can pull out decisions like that, programmatic decisions from this type of information. Um, people uh, focused on this as a place to relax on Wednesdays. Okay, people, work people are going here, or people that are around, they're enjoying it in the middle of the week um, to get that, you know, um, place to relax, place to get away and um, de-stress. 
Um, and then they focus a lot on seasonal change and holiday offerings. So if we think about this, and you saw the picture of where it's located in the middle of urban context, this is providing people really a place to celebrate the seasons and a place to celebrate and see that leaf change, right, in that little spot in the middle of the city, um, a place to um, celebrate the holidays. So moving into that second phase of this research, and a reminder, this is when we went in and started reading everything and breaking everything apart. Um, we came up with four major themes um, and 18 secondary concepts that emerged. So you can see that we quantified the number of mentions. So every time we coded something under something like respite, um, that was um, a quantification of it. They were mentioned this many times, so you can see but that's what's going on here with these charts is we're trying to figure out how much people are talking about different things specifically. Um, and these actually came forward to uh, form a basic framework for how we could understand the experience in Bryant Park. Now we can't say that this is all urban parks or all um, areas like this, but we explored this one park. It's not generalizable yet. If we did this 10 times, we'd start getting closer to that, okay? Um, so of the four major themes that emerged, um, design was the most commonly mentioned at 36%. So people were really talking about physical features such as greenery or the placement of movable chairs and how they really liked that, um, the location of restrooms, the location of um, certain things. And so really things that you would design, um, people were talking about a lot, which of course as a landscape architect made me smile thinking, yes, what we're doing really does have an impact on how people are experiencing place. Um, essence was the second um, most common category. So people were talking about their feelings, how it made them feel, and it was pretty positive, right? Um, so we learned that. Um, activity was the third, and this is when people really were talking about, I attended yoga, I ate a hot dog, you know, whatever they were specifically doing um, as action, people watching, by the way, was one of the biggest ones, um, eating and drinking and people watching, but people love people watching in this space, which of course reinforces that CNBC and socialization aspect um, of the benefits of urban spaces. Um, position was the last one. So they were talking about the convenience of the site, um, how they could get to it from the subway, how it was around the corner from something. But the interesting thing that came out of that category was that everybody, not everybody, a lot of the reviewers thought that um, they had stumbled upon a hidden gym or they had found this mysterious place that nobody knew about. And there was a lot of reviews about that. And so this is one of the most um, active public spaces in the world. Um, if we go back to environmental psychology and how people have studied places in the past we've learned that they like mystery okay and for some reason people think that this park is like a mystery even though it's one of the most popular parks in the world so how did the designers do that it's kind of an interesting um, thought and an interesting perception that I found intriguing so I mentioned that we wanted to understand how positively people thought about things um, we can get a category um, such as um, restrooms and we can say okay there's this many people talking about it so do they like it do they not like it um, this sentiment analysis basically uh, went through in vivo software and it picked out words and those have a ranking of like positive neutral negative it was actually a five point rating system um, and so uh, words like vary added to that system okay so it did um, take that into context so we actually could calculate um, and try and put together a general calculation for each of these topics based upon um, not the quantity of mentions but how positively people felt about it okay so kind of the grand finale of that qualitative portion of this research was a framework for experience of place at Bryant Park. That's all I can say about this, right? Um, but again, if we did a lot of these, if we perform a lot of studies, then we can start to pull some major conclusions through social media data. So the size of each of these sections reflects the number of mentions within those reviews. Um, and then the color, the darker the color, 
the more positive sentiment is associated with that. So you can start to put those together and look, wow, design is really important. Um, then you could go read the study, see, see you know, specifically what elements they're talking about. Essence is really important, but not as much positive sentiment. So you can see how we started piecing apart this site um, to kind of understand how people were using it, how people were experiencing it, what they thought about it. Okay, I'm gonna add a few items for discussion. Um, there's a lot of limitations to social media data too that we have to recognize. It's messy. People make fake accounts. People make accounts that try and bolster their businesses. Um, you know, and so we have to consider that. We also have to consider that um, you know, it's a certain population. We use TripAdvisor. That happens to be middle-aged people more women than men, okay? That's the population that gave us this information. Now, if I combined this in a larger study with another form of social media data, um, we'd get more information from different populations. But that is um, a limitation to this. See, we also only used English reviews, okay? So I've got to think about that. That's a context, that's a lens that is a limitation of this. Um, so we just have to be transparent about these things, right? I would love to fit everything into certain studies, but I think I have my, my life and I'm excited to explore um, these different facets of place and understand the different perspectives. Um, so what's the significance of this particular study that I just presented? Well, parks play a critical role in the wellness of our cities. Um, and so better understanding them can help us to make um, informed decisions about how we can design and plan these spaces. And that's really critical right now. Um, it's critical because they're being used so much and they're serving such a large role um, for us. But I mentioned, I've all, I, I looked at experience of place, and there's a lot of different ways to use social media data. And of course, you want to stick, um, I want to stick to my areas of expertise, but um, I have a few upcoming studies that will consider socioeconomic factors, so parks in different parts of the city and looking at different perceptions um, within that. Also, multicultural views, looking at different um, reviews from different languages, understanding um, space from different perspectives, which can lead to more inclusive designs, okay? And I'm gonna briefly touch on other case studies that I've applied these methods to or similar methods. So we talked about experience of place. Um, I've also explored sense of place through the Las Vegas Strip. So you can imagine what reviewing that social media data was um, like. So, um, for this study, we used over 20,000 TripAdvisor um, reviews under the name of The Strip. Um, and this is one of the most well-visited attractions um, in our country. So this was um, fascinating to look at, and the data was from 2010 to 2018. We went through a similar LDA modeling process, and 29 topics emerged in that. That one had the highest um, that was the best model that we came up with. And so it was a lot of topics. But um, what we did is we ran, the second step for this study was running those reviews through the lens of sense of place. And um, if any of you have looked at sense of place, you understand that it's a, what you would call a multifaceted construct. So there's a lot going on when we think about human perceptions of place and sense of place. And in this study we used place attachment, place identity, place dependence, and place quality. So place quality is those tangible characteristics of place, the physical place, the one that we design. And so I'll point out just one interesting finding from this. Um, it's hard to see these colors, I'm sure, but we looked at the number of mentions and also the likability or the, how much people, how much positiveness went into them and the place did not get a high remark. He did, did not get high remarks. People did not like how it looked. They liked it for other reasons, right? That whole see and be seen aspect and the things that you see there, but it was not the place itself that attracted people um, that received a lot of negative sentiment. Um, with social media data, it's easy to focus on those very popular spaces because there's a lot of data out there on those spaces. Um, 
I was asked to do a pilot study for Fort Gaines, Georgia, and I, I did this because it was interesting to me to see how this could be applied um, for accessibility of place and understanding um, smaller municipalities who can't always get all of the feedback um, from, for example, town hall meetings and that sort of thing. So in this study, I actually used another form of um, data. It was cellular phone data from SafeGraph. So that takes information from different applications um, and it is all anonymous, but we were able to look at a few different facets of this place. So um, we were able to look at how far people travel to get to points of destination. And then we were able to also understand the um, general income level of those um, people. And the reason is because it assesses what block group, census block group people are coming from and where they're going to. So why would we want to do this? Well, we can understand where, what places people can't get to, right? Um, particularly lower income populations. We can start to decipher where they're going, where they're not going, where, where do we need to design trails to or put bus stops at. So so this is um, really a powerful way to look at this. And then we also use Google Places data to understand, again, um, people's perceptions of those places and why they liked them. Okay, so the use of big data um, is becoming less and less of a novelty um, in many fields. In landscape architecture, um, we're kind of cracking into this and we're using it. Um, and I think that the methods specifically are interesting because, um, again, I want us to be at the forefront of um, capitalizing and using what's out there to be used and the information. Um, so we can look at places with 10 years of data. Um, I think that we, we should be doing that to inform our site analyses, our post-occupancy evaluations, that sort of thing. Okay, so I'm gonna, conclude by looking at the applicability of this in the classroom and how I've kind of pulled this in again to get um, the perceptions of students who always provide new perspectives to me. So two summers ago during the height of the pandemic I taught a fully online summer studio. Um, these students were supposed to be studying abroad instead they were online with me. So um, I was trying to think how can this be interesting? Okay I'll make them do some different things. Um, so I was trying to figure out since we could not meet in person we definitely could not go to the site in person and so I wanted to explore different methods for site analyses um, for before they did their designs so our site was the Atlanta Beltline East Side Trail and what I had them do um, is I actually had them purchase um, Google Cardboard headsets, um, which are I think under $10, so that they could do ride-throughs with VR. Um, so we literally took a camera on a bike down um, the trail and then they got to experience that, but they could look around and see and hear what was going on. Um, so that was one approach. Um, I gave them social media data from TripAdvisor and Instagram. That was another approach. And then the third approach was looking at VR hotspots. So we went and took 360 images, stitched them together, and then they could put on their Google Cardboard sets and go to different places and look around and really kind of zoom in on things. Um, and so, of course, I'll focus on the social media, but um, through each of these methods, I asked the students a series of questions just to try and understand what they were experiencing, what frustrations they had, and what they got out of it. Um, and this was, again, so I could better understand um, where we could go with this. So I gave each student design uh, team 1,000 Instagram photos um, from the site and 400 TripAdvisor reviews and had them categorize the information to see what they could learn from it. So I wanted to share a glimpse of some of their projects, really to just show where these methods actually fit into a um, studio project from the perspective of student learning. So this group charted the timestamps of Instagram photos to understand what day and time people were taking photos. Um, they noted that peak hours were in the early evening, but there was a really active nightlife here. So their designs could accommodate that or they could also aim to bolster those hours when people weren't using the site. The same group deciphered the feelings and emotions that they saw from Instagram users um, and joy was the predominant emotion that they pulled out of that. 
Hey, from the student surveys, um, they believe that social media data is the best way to understand the human experience over those other methods that I described. So they were good for different things, but social media was the best to understand that um, those social aspects of place. Um, it also helped them to understand site programming and space usage. Students recognized that social media data can be used to inform designs and it can also be used to assess spaces afterwards. So this is some of the overwhelming feedback that I got that they found value in. Um, and I'll conclude. These are the publications um, that are associated with this work. One under review and two other out there. Um, and I'll mention or remind you of the upcoming presentation in Nashville with the ASLA conference on landscape architecture. Hey, I appreciate your attention this afternoon. Thank you so much.